Instead of protecting the citizens' rights of, of life, liberty, and property, the state is often the number one violator of these rights. Instead of enabling citizens to pursue happiness, the state has often been the source of untold war, sorrow, and suffering. It has, throughout history, been uh, responsible for pogroms, massacres, summer executions, unspeakable barbarities, and other very wicked acts. This forced the French philosopher Rousseau to lament that man is born free and everywhere he's in chains. Consequently, ladies and gentlemen, bloody revolutions, rebellions, and insurgencies have been waged and continue to be waged by citizens in the exercise of their natural right to rebel, to overthrow tyrannical regimes, and to regain their rights. The horrors of the Auschwitz concentration camp, whose liberation we commemorate, commemorate, commemorated just last week, reminds of all this. Now, then what is the status of the individual and international law, that is, traditional international law? The function of law, ladies and gentlemen, good law, I should emphasize, whether domestic or international, is ultimately to serve the interests of the human being, albeit in his individual state. So what has been the function of international law when the events described above took place? As far as international tradition, as um, traditional international was concerned, individual human rights were considered as, let me repeat, individual human beings were considered as mere objects and not subjects of that law. Individuals could not directly, as we've been told, derive rights under that law. They also lacked capacity to enforce those rights at the international plane. States, we've been reminded, solely and exclusively, we are considered to be the only objects, of, subjects of international law. Additionally, treatment of individuals was considered to be a matter within the exclusive jurisdiction of the country in which they resided. Thus, individuals living under the tyranny unleashed by their state had no recourse to outside help. Other states could not protest or intercede on their behalf, let alone attempt to protect them. If they did, they would, be, uh, they would face accusations of interfering in the internal affairs of the states concerned, or with violating international you know, sovereignty. We must also admit, just in passing, that quite often, Many states, even if they had the power to remonstrate with other states over the treatment of their citizens, lacked the moral authority to do so because they too behave in the same manner. There were, of course, uh, exceptions to, to these general uh, positions. We've, told, been, we've heard about uh, uh, the minimum standard of justice, ordinary uh, standards of justice according to which foreign nationals were to be treated, and how this uh, entitled their state of uh, nationality to diplomatically protect them at the international level. Um, but even then, as the Permanent Court of International Justice put it, by taking up the case, one of its, uh, you know, by taking up the case of one of its subjects, by resorting to diplomatic action or international judicial proceedings on his behalf, a state in reality was asserting its own right, that is, the right to ensure in the person of its subjects respect uh, for the rules of uh, international law. We should also here, of course, note that uh, a state that uh, espoused uh, a claim on behalf of uh, an individual um, they had to exist a bond, a bond. That's the bond of nationality. And absent that bond, a state was not entitled to espouse a claim that on behalf of that individual. 
This means that stateless persons, until recently, were not, could not be protected. We should also note that the right of diplomatic protection was a right that belonged to the state and not to the individual. And therefore, the individual could not demand or even get it. We, again, with respect to foreign nationals, um, there was uh, this thing about uh, the right of asylum. Um, that uh, states were in, uh, had the right to uh, grant asylum to individuals that were being persecuted. But even then, the right of asylum, although called a right, did not belong to the individual, but belonged to the state that is uh, granting it. And again, with respect to um, protection of foreign nationals, uh, a, a, a state traditionally had the right to intervene on the territory of another state in order to protect those individuals, even using force. This is a right, this is, uh, they call it international um, right of humanitarian intervention, but it's very much contested. Um, so, all in all, under traditional international law, individuals and victims of gross violation of human rights or of tyranny were in a precarious and vulnerable position. Short of re rebellion, they had, no re uh, they had no avenues of recourse beyond their borders or at the international plane. Additionally, ladies and gentlemen, because of the then dominant positivist school of jurisprudence and the faulty notions of international law being based solely on state consent, protection of the individual and his or her rights was not considered a proper subject of international law. But there is a new era, ladies and gentlemen. With the wane of positivism and the cataclysmic events of World War II, the situation began to change. As one uh, uh, Italian scholar, Ruth Nicolosi, put it, while states were considered the only subjects of international law, the individuals and their rights were juridically neglected. But already, a dawn of a new idea is in sight. When governments are reminded that they are not celestial bodies, but products of man for man. Ladies and gentlemen, the Allied powers, after their triumph over Hitler and the Axis powers, considered that the protection of the individual and his or her rights worldwide was an essential element in the scheme for the maintenance of international peace and security. For this reason, the UN Charter lists as one of the organization's lofty uh, purposes the protection and encouragement of respect for human rights and for fundamental freedoms for all. The Charter also mandates its organs, the organs of the UN, such as the General Assembly, ECOSOC, Trusteeship Council, to encourage respect for human rights worldwide. The General Assembly, too, for its part, are asserted in the preamble to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that it is essential if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. So, ladies and gentlemen, where is international law in all this? It is visible and conspicuous everywhere, I should say. First, the Charter, the UN Charter, is a treaty which some have referred to as the Treaty of Treaties. As such, it is an international agreement between sovereign states governed by international law. International law ordains that parties to a treaty must observe and carry out the obligation they assume under the treaty in good faith. Thus, the International Court of Justice had to remind South Africa in the Namibia case that the human rights provisions of the Charter were not mere moral exhortations, but were legally binding obligations which states had to carry out. 
The court also found South Africa in a flagrant violation of its obligations when it introduced the pernicious apartheid system in Namibia. Secondly, ladies and gentlemen, the UN Charter did for the first time formally recognize human rights as forming part of the international corpus juris independent of municipal law. This recognition tends to show that the individual can be a subject, albeit a unique subject of international law, capable of directly deriving rights from that law. So as the ICJ opined in the famous reparations case, the subjects of law in any legal system are not necessarily identical in their nature or in the extent of their rights. And their nature depends upon the needs of the community, the ICJ said. It is true, ladies and gentlemen, that international law is dynamic and organic and it can grow and has grown to advance the interests of the international community. Additionally, in my view, the fact that the individual still lacks full procedural capacity at the international plane does not detract from this evolving trend regarding the individual. After all, ladies and gentlemen, there are instances even under municipal law when the individual, for reasons of age, or mental capacity may be legally incapable of enforcing his or her rights, and yet he or she has rights. Third, I'm getting to the end, by declaring human rights protection as one of the purposes of the UN, and by creating specialized agencies dedicated to this task, the UN Charter unwittingly opened the door for victims of human rights to individually, find, uh, rather, rather con individually file complaints the UN against the, uh, the early states. For a while, these agencies ignored complaints from individuals, saying that these bodies had no power to take action on such complaints, or that they could not act as judge between the complainants and their governments. Yet, Thousands of complaints continue to flood the offices of the UN every year. The UN could no longer ignore these complaints. It finally awoke to the realization that human rights without enforcement are like shadows without substance. They acknowledged the old Latin adage of UB, UCB remedium, that is, where there is a right there must be a remedy. Accordingly, in the famous ECOSOC Resolution 1503 of uh, 1970, ECOSOC established a machinery under which individuals could directly complain to UN human rights bodies against state violators of human rights. It provided individuals with the procedural capacity at the international plane that they had hitherto lacked. The resolution, in my view, was epical. Additionally, today there exists a, a myriad of treaties geared toward the promotion of various aspects of human rights. These treaties impose obligations on states to respect and ensure the, the rights uh, uh, concerned. Some do have enforcement mechanisms, such as on-the-spot investigation, and direct complaint procedures by individuals before treaty bodies. It is true that for, in, for an individual to be able to utilize these procedures, his or her state of nationality must have assented by making a declaration to that effect or by ratifying a particular instrument or an additional protocol. Nevertheless, ladies and gentlemen, for individuals whose states have accepted the, the procedures, this is, this is still a breakthrough in my submission. And I, I'm getting to the end. Fourth, and related to the above points, by making promotion of human rights one of the purposes of, UA, of the UN, the Charter removed the treatment of the individual 
from the exclusive domain of states, a hitherto no uh, go area. One of the effects of this development was to remove the conceptual barrier that had hitherto denied individuals direct access to international forums to enforce their human rights. The other is that the wronging state can no longer waive the non-intervention rule as a bar to others to remonstrate, complain, condemn, or even take concrete action to stop the violations or for the good of the individual. Fifth, the human rights provision of the UN Charter have inspired regional organizations to put promotion of human rights on their agendas. For instance, the African, American, and uh, European Convention on Human Rights not only elaborate on individual human rights and fundamental rights, but also establish mechanisms for allegations of human rights violation to be investigated and adjudicated at the behest of, among others, individual victims. Finally, to all this, we must add the developments in the area of international criminal law, which is a branch of international law, and the mushrooming of international criminal tribunals. Under these developments, a person charged with international crimes or crimes against the law of nations cannot, cannot hide behind the corporate veil of the state and say, it was not me, it was the state. I was only acting on the orders of the state or under the laws of the state, and that as a loyal citizen, I had to obey my state and the law. Such person, if he or she appears before an international criminal tribunal, he or she will be reminded of the first Nuremberg principle that any person who commits an act which constitutes a crime under international law is responsible, therefore, and liable to punishment. In other words, he or she is individually responsible. The Rome Statute and the Statutes of other tribunals have codified this principle. And in a familiar, uh, in a familiar passage, the Nuremberg Tribunal very neatly provided the rationale for this principle when it said, crimes against international law are committed by man and woman not by abstract entities. And only by punishing individuals who commit such crimes can provisions of international law be enforced. Thus, ladies and gentlemen, in addition to being a beneficiary of rights derived directly from both customary international law and from treaties, the individual does also bear direct obligations under international law. If this be true then, can we deny that the individual has a standing under international law? I submit we cannot. Nevertheless, I would here repeat my high school motto and say, Gachi Arimabaga, which means so little done and so much to do to advance the status of the individual under international law. Thank you for your patience.